Beloved, let us give our attention to the word of God. He, Hosea chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. The Lord here is speaking through his prophet. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the bales and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love. And I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. And I bent down to them and fed them. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities, consume the bars of their gates, and devour devour them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning away from me. And though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, declares the Lord. Amen. Thus saith the Lord. Well, the message of this chapter comes through with even a cursory reading. God has been good to Israel, but Israel has not been good to God. God has lavished his love upon an ungrateful nation. Israel deserves to be consumed by the wrath of God. And yet God's heart strangely goes out to them in mercy and compassion, simply as he says, because he's God and not a man. And because even if they are unfaithful to the covenant, he remains faithful. The more time we spend in the prophets, and now we have come to this chapter in Hosea, but the more time we spend in the prophets and the more familiar we become with Israel's history, the more convinced we are And the more convinced we should be at least that salvation arises from God's free grace. And that if we get what we deserve, if God gave us what we deserve, we would all perish. Because remember, the purpose of Israel's history in Scripture is to give every one of us a window into his own heart. A window into what human nature in and of itself and by itself is like. Because it's against the backdrop of our own depravity and sinfulness put on display in the life of of Israel that we can best see what God is like and how very unlike us he really is. As Paul says in Romans 9, Israel was an extremely privileged nation. Is there any benefit to being a Jew, he asks. Yes, he responds. An extremely privileged nation. But those privileges never annulled the responsibility and the obligation upon those Jews to believe the gospel that was preached to them and to obey the God who chose them. Because you see, grace comes freely to an undeserving people. It's the only way it can come because that's all the kind of people there is. Grace comes freely to an undeserving people, but when it comes, grace puts you under obligation. An obligation to believe the message of grace an obligation to repent of your old ways, and an obligation to walk in the new ways consonant with the grace that you've received. And no one got the message of grace like Israel did, and no one was as negligent as Israel was to heed the obligations that came with it. So Hosea this morning in these verses in chapter 11, Hosea traces four lines of thought that we need to consider. We'll spend most of our time on the first one, as you can see in the outline before you. First of all, God's love to an undeserving people. Secondly, Israel's ingratitude to a gracious God. Thirdly, God's judgments upon an ungrateful nation. And then fourthly, God's compassion 
to a remnant of grace. The chapter begins with God speaking about how good he has been to Israel. And he gives seven examples. Follow along with me if you will. We'll walk right through these opening verses. First of all, in verse 1, the Lord says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. Here God highlights the priority of his grace. Not only to Israel, but this principle stands for all time and in all cases. To all those whom God saves. Grace is prior to anything and everything that it produces. He's referring, of course, as he says this in verse 1, to their hopeless condition in Egypt. That that was where God found them, as it were. And when he came to them, they were like a helpless child. Of course, they were descendants of Abraham. They were, in fact, heirs of the covenant God made with Abraham in Genesis 15. God told Abraham in Genesis 15 that they would be in that foreign land for 430 years. But there was nothing in their lives at this point, nothing in their lives that testified to that when they were slaves under Pharaoh's bitter oppression and every male child was being cast into the Nile River to be drowned and the nation is in danger of being demolished. They were an unknown people. More than that, a hated people, a crushed people. They were a persecuted people. They were a dying people. No one had pity on them. No one knew they was, that they were there and no one even cared. But it was then, says the Lord, it was then, in that lost condition, that I loved them. You see, God's love came to them. Exodus 2, at the end of that chapter, says that God heard their groaning, God saw their suffering, and God remembered His covenant of grace. He remembered that it was in fact through that people and that nation that He had purposed to bring His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, And so if we put all our cards on the table right here, it was for Christ's sake that God went into Egypt and got that nation. Because it was through them that he would bring the Lord Jesus. It was for Christ's sake that God loved them, even there. And again, it's meant to show us that wherever God appears on the scene of a man's life to bring salvation, his grace has the glory of priority. God's love can't be bought It can't be earned. It can't be wooed or enticed by anything in us, even our misery, because our misery is a deserved misery. We're responsible for our own undoing. But instead, as Moses said to Israel before they entered the land in Deuteronomy 7, he says, God's love arises from his own heart for his own reasons, and it sets itself freely on those whom he chooses to love. He loves whom he loves because he loves them. That's what Moses says. And so God says here as he begins in this chapter, when Israel was a child, helpless, hopeless, undone, and lost, it's as much as to say, I would have done him no wrong to leave him there. But I loved him. God's love is the sole cause of every good we enjoy in salvation because God's love is what brings us Christ. John 3, 16. Secondly, look again. God says, out of Egypt I called my son. Now as you know, Matthew 2, 15 says this is fulfilled in Christ's return to Judea from Egypt as our head. And we don't have time to go into that particular this morning. But for now, here the Lord is reminding Israel that when he loved them in Egypt, that love manifested itself in their deliverance. Something nobody else could have done. Something, as Moses said in Deuteronomy 4, no God ever did. And given their situation, that deliverance... As Moses goes on to describe it, and as they experienced that deliverance, was a redemption. It was a redemption from slavery. It brought life to those who were dead. It brought freedom to those who were held captive. It it brought a name to a people that had no name. It brought mercy to those, as Peter says, who knew no mercy. It brought grace to those who didn't deserve it. And every one of those images is meant to serve as a picture of the nature of God's favor toward them. And to show that God's love, it's, it's a redeeming love. It's, it's a saving love, a, a rescuing love. That's how God loves. It's a love that brings freedom, that brings life. Most of all, it's a love that adopts and makes us sons. Remember what God said of Israel to Pharaoh, let my firstborn son go. God called Israel his son. It's a love that brings us into the most intimate fellowship possible by making us sons of God and heirs of all of His covenant favors. You alone, says the Lord in Amos, you alone have I loved. And so what verse verse 1 is saying is this. God not only loved Israel in her infancy, 
but he loved her before she was ever born, before she had ever done anything good or bad, when she was a nobody with nothing in Egypt. Again, God's love has the the glory of priority in all our salvation. You can't get behind it because nothing is behind it. It's the very beginning of all the saving good we know, the love of God. And rightly so, because John tells us in 1 John, God is love. And he goes on to say, we love him because he first loved us. Thirdly, look at verse 3. God says further, it was I who taught Israel to walk. You see, God loved them. And because he did, he redeemed them. He gave them life. He called them son. And then in the wilderness, that's what's being pictured here, in the wilderness of their infancy, God taught them to walk. He gave them Moses to lead them. He gave them angels to protect them. He gave them priests to teach them. He gave them his laws to guide them. God was like a tutor to teach them. He was like a father to discipline them. He was even like a mother to hold their little hands and help them walk, leading them, the Bible says, by a pillar of cloud by day and a fire by night. They didn't stray in the wilderness for 40 years. They didn't stray because God led them. They didn't stumble because God upheld them. They didn't perish because God was with them. Remember Moses says, your your shoes didn't even wear out. No other nation had a God to care for them like this because no other nation was loved, quickened, and adopted to be the people of God. It was divine favor like no other. It was divine favor like no other, none could give, never before seen, because it was the love of God himself. Fourthly, when Israel did fall, look what the Lord says. When they turned out of the way like a selfish child, as becomes so clear in the wilderness narrative, when they turned out of the way like a selfish child, God says, it was I who healed them. It was I who made up the breach. It was I who restored. It was I who pardoned. It was I who had mercy on them. It was I who suffered the loss of their injuries. It was I who bore the cost of their recovery. God's glory, if you will, took the blow, took the hit. What kind of a God is this? He leads you out and with Pharaoh behind in the sea before? What kind of a God is this? Leads you into a wilderness desert with no food and no water? God's love was not only prior to Israel's, but it was persevering. It was forgiving in a way that's incredible and awesome. Fifthly, in verse 4, God says, I led them with cords of kindness and bands of love. It's from the picture of a farmer leading his oxen in the field, which, of course, he usually does with rigor and toughness so that the ox will know its master and the ox will obey him. It's also the picture of a cruel master leading his slaves with ropes and whips Here God changes the image and look at what he says. He says, I led Israel with kindness and love. My cords were kindness. My yoke around their neck was love. As a parent, God might say, I never raised my voice to them. I never yelled to terrify them. Instead, I wooed them. I beckoned them. I drew them by the power of my kindness. God sought to overwhelm and overcome and to draw them with cords of kindness. Who is good like our God? Warranted, indeed, it demanded a response of love and faith and obedience and worship. No other nation, no other nation on earth was being treated the way God was treating Israel. The prophets lament that fact repeatedly. There's nothing more, in fact, God says through Isaiah, there's nothing more he could have done for them to show his more favor than he did. Number six, God says, I became to them as one who eases the yoke. Here it's the picture of a farmer who has such compassion on his beast under hard labor for many, many hours in the hot sun that he'll come alongside the beast and he'll he'll lift the yoke off its neck. Even if just for a moment to bear the weight of the yoke himself so that the beast can rest. The idea is that when Israel in their childish, childish petulance complained that the yoke was too heavy, God's way was too hard, which they did so often, God says he came along and he lightened the load. He carried that weight on his shoulders, which they, out of their love for him, should have easily and happily borne on their shoulders. So great is our God. Who is a people like the people of Israel? Because they have a God like Yahweh. 
no weight he gave them was ever too much. His love to them was strengthening and enabling. They had all they needed to easily bear what God put upon them. But still, so great was his mercy to them and so great was his love for them that he says, I eased your yoke so that you wouldn't faint along the way. Nothing, dear church, nothing can explain the far reaches and the great depths of God's love, but that he loves, not like a man, but like God, like only God can and God does. Lastly here, God says, I bent down to them and fed them. You know the image. How clear is it through the wilderness wanderings with manna every morning in the desert, with quail for meat, water from the rocks. The Lord fed his people where there was no food at all. In all their years in the wilderness, they never went hungry. And when he brought them, of course, into the land of promise, he gave them wells they didn't have to dig, orchards and vineyards they didn't have to plant, flocks and herds in abundance for all the meat that their hearts desired. The psalmist says the beasts have to cry to God for their food, and he gives it. But the Lord says, I bent down and fed my people. God's abundant provision was like that of a mother for her young child. She prepares every meal. She brings it over to the child, and she spoon feeds him. Such was the care that God gave Israel. He catered to them. He carved their food for them. He fed them. As the psalmist says, they only had to open their mouths and he would fill it. Dear congregation, behold the love of God. Behold the love of God. There is nothing like it in all the world. There's nothing like it in the heart of any man on earth. And nothing like it outside of Jesus Christ, the love of God in the flesh who came to bring God's love to sinners like you and me. This is the love of God being showered on Israel. It's the same love of God which he has showered on all of those who know him and welcome the gospel of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no love like God's love. But the point of the chapter, of course, and the reason Hosea was sent to them was to rebuke them for so poor a return on God's love to them, that God's love was compelled to give way to God's judgments, that the God who drew them in found it necessary to cast them away again. Israel's ingratitude to God is inexcusable and shameful, and God gives four instances of it. Again, look at your Bibles. In verse 2, the Lord says, The more they were called, the more they went away. It's an interesting way to put it, isn't it? God is saying it's common knowledge that when I called Israel, Israel went away from me. Everyone knows this. The nations know this. My name has been shamed among the nations because when I call Israel, they run the other way. But here God would show us just how ungrateful they were by saying, I want you to know that the more I called them, the more they went away. There's a balance here, as it were. God called them to repentance. They went on in sin. God called them to obedience. They go on in disobedience. He called them to worship. And they went on in idolatry. Whatever it was, the more God reached out toward them, the farther they went away from him. The more they were determined to match their ingratitude to his kindness, like intentionally provoking him. Whatever God says, we will do the exact opposite. The more I called, the more they went away. Number two, God says they kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning incense to idols. Again, notice the language. Notice how God puts it here. It was bad enough that they did it. But God says they kept doing it. They persisted in it. How many times did God make clear that Baal is no God? That the idols of the nations are nothing. But they kept doing it in the face of every incentive to do otherwise. In the face of every chastisement and discipline, every warning, every prophet. They kept doing it, God says. Nothing could take them off from it. Idolatry was the sin that they loved. It was a sin that they persisted in. It was a sin that they were determined on. There was this determination in their hearts. It was, there was a commitment to it. They refused to do otherwise. They kept doing it, God says. Thirdly, God says they didn't, they didn't know that it was I who healed them. 
Now, again, Israel's ignorance is always purposeful. So what it means here, what the prophet is saying is they refuse to acknowledge that it was I. When they weren't happy with Moses and Aaron, they rose up against them. They murmured as if they dealt with men and not with God. And they treated the prophets the same way. When the prophets came speaking the word of God, they just killed them. Get rid of that man. Get rid of that guy. That'll silence it. No more preaching. They refused to acknowledge it was God who called them, these men, these leaders. It was God who spoke through them. It was God who used them. It was God who authorized them. They despised God's men as if they were mere men. They didn't know that it was I, says the Lord. And lastly here on this account, verse 7, God says, My people are bent on turning away from me. Again, the language is intentional. The Lord says they don't simply turn away. That would be bad enough. But they're bent on it. See how the Lord's poking at the heart here, the motives, the affections, they're bent on it. They're so set on it that the slightest temptation or the slightest opportunity to do evil is all that they need. They don't need persuading. They don't need convincing. Just open the door for them and they'll run right through it, away from God and all of His goodness and all of His love. Just show them your new idol and they'll want one too. If nothing more were said than verse 7, this sums it all up. My people, of all people, just think of the words. Every word carries weight. My people are bent on turning away from me. No one has done for them what God did for them. No one. No people are like this people. So favored, so loved, so blessed, so cared for. And no people has proven to be like this people in being bent on turning away from the very God who is so gracious and good. They love it. They default to it. They run for it. They're resolved at every chance they get every single time. Do you see the reasonableness of God's judgments? No, no wonder we move next into the judgments of God. Look at verses 5 and 6. God speaks next of His judgment coming. We see the reasonableness, reasonableness of God's judgment. In fact, not only the reasonableness of it on God's part, but we see the reason for it on Israel's part. Because they refuse to return to me. God is drawing, drawing, beckoning, and they continue to go the other way. In verses 5 and 6, God says, They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria will rule over them, and his sword shall abide on them. You remember we've talked about this topic already. When God threatened to chastise them, they figured they would just take refuge in Egypt. That's a great way to get away from God. God is in Israel. We'll go to Egypt. He can't find us there. He can't reach us there. We'll go to Egypt to protect us. But God says he will deny them the comfort of a refuge in Egypt. They will not go to Egypt, says the Lord. Instead, I will send them into Assyria under the yoke of exile. Why? Because they refuse to return to me. They figured anything is better than God. Better to be with Pharaoh in Egypt than in Canaan with God. But they'll soon find, as we all always do, there's nothing better than God. But whatever we opt for in the place of God is a change for the worse and not for the better. Sin can't give what only God can give. And rebellion will always give what we fear we'll find in God, which makes us run away. So what then? Well, we expect to hear that God will give up on them at last. Look at verse 8. We expect to hear that God will shake the dust from his feet like Paul in Antioch and say, Away with you, Israel. I am turning to the Gentiles. Remember when he said that? I was told to come to you first, but I'm going to shake the dust off my feet and I'm going to go to the Gentiles because you refuse the grace that is extended to you. We expect to hear that there and it would be just. But instead, we find ourselves, as we walk through this as a congregation now, we find ourselves in the fifth message of hope in Isaiah's prophecy. There's one more at the last chapter. We find ourselves in the fifth message of hope in Hosea's prophecy. And what we find is we hear God, as it were, arguing within himself over what to do with such a people. Look at verses 8 to 11. In verses 8 and 9, we read a passage in which God speaks to us like a man in order to accommodate our understanding. Let's be clear, God doesn't struggle. God's not at a loss what to do. His decree is eternal and perfect and needs no changing. His attributes aren't at war within himself. But he speaks in this way so that we can better understand the situation. And to cut right to the chase of it all, there are three things that we are meant to see here. We are meant to understand by what God says in verses 8 to 11. 
or 8 and 9, we're meant to see that Israel is guilty as sin. Adma and Zeboim were cities in the plain that were destroyed alongside Sodom and Gomorrah. There are five cities. We only hear about Sodom and Gomorrah. But these cities were likewise in the plain, and they were destroyed by that singular judgment of God, fire from heaven. When God says, how can I treat you like those cities? He's saying, you are as guilty as they are, and you deserve what they got. That's what he's saying. That's what he means. You deserve to be treated like those cities, but how can I do that? There's nothing that can mitigate their guilt. They're guilty as sin. Secondly, we're meant to see here in these verses 8 and 9 that the only reason that they're not being consumed is, of course, by the mercy of God. God says his heart recoils, his compassion grows warm and tender because who, for what they are, they're his people. You see, the only thing God is saying here, the only thing holding back what they deserve is God himself. And again, he's not at war with himself. The point being made is he delights in mercy. And in fact, he's ordained a way, at least for the remnant within Israel, he's ordained a way to actually satisfy his own justice by judging Christ in their place. We know this is the gospel. Even in the Old Testament, this is the gospel. And that's why he says he won't execute his burning anger. He won't come in wrath. He won't come and completely destroy them. Yes, they deserve to be treated that way, but he won't. Because there is mercy and there is grace and there is provision. Whatever judgments he has in store for them, that judgment, and yes, it's coming, but that judgment, it will actually sift from all that chaff in Israel, which is the majority. It will sift a people for himself. It will, it will actually sift a remnant of grace. He will destroy and burn and consume but out of the ashes will rise a remnant. The only reason they're not being consumed is because of the mercy of God. And thirdly, he is God and not man. That's what we're meant to see here. He is God and not man, and he won't come in wrath. In other words, he is the God who makes and keeps covenant. And as I said, in that covenant, which began to take shape with his promises to Abraham, in that covenant, there is Provision for pardon. There's provision for mercy to sinners. There's provision for grace to the penitent. Because there's provision of a sacrifice of atonement and a priest of reconciliation whose name is Jesus Christ. There's provision for these terrible sinners who are bent on turning away. There's provision. And those provisions of the covenant are, in fact, look at verses 10 and 11. Suddenly we hear this testimony of return and reconciliation. It's those provisions of the covenant which secure the prophetic vision in verses 10 and 11, in which God says His people will again come back to the Lord. They'll be turned away from their idols and all their backsliding. And they'll have a heart that runs after God, not away from God. They'll have a heart that returns to God as one returns to his home. Home, sweet home, no place like home. That's how they will long for God and find God, coming back to God with joy, coming back to God because there's my rest. There my soul finds peace and happiness and rest. And the Lord gives this image wherever they are, in whatever place, even in bondage, even in exile, Egypt, Assyria, it doesn't matter. The Lord says, even from there, when he calls, they will come. They will hear. They will return. It brings up the image of Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the temple in 1 Kings 8. Wherever they are, Lord, and whatever sin and whatever they've done, whatever mess, however they got themselves over there and all that trouble, if they but turn and look toward your temple and seek your face, hear, forgive, restore. That's what God is saying, the very thing. And why? How in the world can there be such hope in the midst of what we know of this nation, this people? The Lord says, because he is God and not a man. He came to save a people. And a people he will have. He will have a church. Right smack dab in the middle of Canaan. He will have a church. He'll preserve in fact that line. Even through all of the exile and all of the judgment. He will preserve that line through which the Christ will be born. Who will save us all by the very grace on display in all this history. Why and how can God be so gracious to a people so wicked? Because of Christ. Because of Christ and the provision in the covenant for sinners who seek God in their sinfulness and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Many will fall away. Many will lose hope. But God will keep covenant. Because he's God. 
He's God and not a man. His salvation of a people never hung on their worth, it never hung on their good deeds, it never depended upon their perseverance. He knew the people he was saving. He knew what they were made of. He knew their metal. But he would have to do, as it were, all the work. His covenant and salvation always hung upon his own free grace, his unconditional covenant, and his persevering love for Christ's sake. You see, judgment will come. The judgment Hosea pronounces, it will come. It does come. It did come. It must come. And it must come upon this nation because there is no place in the covenant for the idolatrous and the impenitent. But the Lord is saying here in this message of hope, His love will yet prevail. Because He's God and not a man. And He keeps covenant forever for all those who seek their grace in Him. All those whose hope is set upon His steadfast love and His new morning mercies. He keeps covenant for them. Two things stand out very clearly in this chapter, beloved. And with this t- these two things, we are driven to two applications this morning. And the first is how clear it is that we need to learn from what we read here this morning to give endless praise to God, that He is God and not a man. And that there is in Him not only perfect justice against our sins, but perfect mercy for sinners who seek their refuge in him. Think about it for a moment. Where would we be, where would you be today if we had to do with the likes of ourselves? Where would we be if we had to do with men and not God? Knowing what we know about ourselves, because the history of Israel, that's your history. That sin nature on display, that's your sin nature. That's all of us. That's what we are. That's why it's there. As I said in the beginning, it's a window into what we're like. What if we had to do with men and not God, beloved? Proverbs 12.10 says, The mercy of the wicked is even cruel. The best of men are at best mere men. And that means they're men enslaved to their passions. Men swelled with pride. Men who love to take a pound of flesh, who love to get even, who love to make people pay. Men who love to lord their power over others. Men who love to capitalize on others' mistakes. Men who love to gloat other, over others' weaknesses. That's what men are like. That's what we're all like. What would verse 8 say if you wrote it? What would verse 9 say if you wrote it? Where would we be, beloved, if God were like us, subject to the whims of his passions, blinded by his anger, stingy with his mercy, cruel in his very kindness? You see, it's the glory of God, and it's the glory of this passage that God is not like us, that God is not a man. When Israel was bent on turning away from God, what a glory it is to hear in this passage that there is mercy in God even for those sinners. The prophets hold out judgment upon judgment upon judgment, and yet it's always conditional. Turn right now, today, turn, and the Lord will relent. What a glory it is to hear that God has mercy for sinners, that there's a covenant with provision for sinners. What a glory to hear in this passage that if God must come in judgment, that he will first come in mercy. This is our God. This is who he is. He's God and not a man. You see, men come in wrath. Men come to destroy for the slightest provocation. Men can't bear to hide their anger. They wear it on their face. They carry it in their conduct. They reveal it in their tone of voice. They punish you as much as they can. They want you to know that you're bad and they're mad. But not God. His ways of mercy, compassion, forgiveness, tenderness, and grace, says Isaiah, are as high above you as the heavens are above the earth. He's not like us. He sent his son to pay your price 
to suffer your penalty, to bear your cross, to drink your cup, so that his mercy could bless you, could pardon you, could love you, to reconcile with you, to honor you, and to sit in fellowship with you at his right hand forever and ever, as if there's no one else in all the world but you. He exalted his son to crush him so that he could exalt you to bless you. And yes, when his justice sought your ruin and say they deserve it, his son took your place so that his mercy could secure your exaltation and salvation. When your sin needed a sacrifice, God took pleasure in offering his son so that his mercy could take pleasure in pardoning you. Sparing, forgiving. The question that arises to all of us this morning is, have you praised God enough that he is not like you? That he doesn't treat you, as we sung from Psalm 103, that he doesn't treat you the way you deserve, but he doesn't treat you the way you treat each other if you were wronged like you have wronged him. Again, if you wrote verses 8 and 9, what would they say? If Israel was your Israel, my people are bent on turning away from me and every favor they've despised. What would verses 8 and 9 say? You couldn't do what God does. You couldn't write that. None of us could. But he did. Because he's God, not man. Dear church, this is your shield. Don't lose sight of this. This is your shield in every doubt and fear when you come to God with your sins because it's all you got. And when you have nothing in yourself to warrant pardon and everything in yourself to justify anger, this is your shield. Lord, you said to me, you're not a man like me. Your God, hold this shield up, beloved. Hide behind it. He is God and not man. And with him, says the psalmist, there is forgiveness. There is grace. Even for you. So fear him, praise him, bless his holy name, and wait for his salvation. Because in Jesus Christ, the very provision of the covenant, he's God. He's your God. He's your Savior. And he will not come in wrath upon any who seek his grace. Secondly, this morning we must learn the height of the sin of ingratitude. If God's love and greatness is on display in this chapter, so is the ingratitude of his people. And I would ask you this morning, congregation, how good has God been to you? Just take it in for a moment. When was the last time you counted all your blessings. When was the last time you considered your benefits, your mercies? When was the last time you recalled what the Lord's done for your soul, for your health, for your life, for your job, for your family, for your church, for your nation? When's the last time you took all that in and just counted, if you dare try, what God has done? Have you made a suitable return to God for all these things? Have you rendered to God the thanks and the praise that are His due? Have you lifted His name on high as the good God that He is? Let the world blaspheme Him. Let the world raise the name of God up in shouts and cries of anger. You lift it up in praise and have you done that? Are you praising him for favoring you? Favoring you so much, even so much more than so many others? Or like Israel, have you forgotten that it was the Lord who carried you then? Think back in your minds, beloved. Have you forgotten that it was the Lord who blessed you there, that place, that time? Have you forgotten that it was the Lord who prospered you then, 
That it was the Lord who protected you and healed you, who delivered you, spared you, exalted you, and did all manner of good for you there and then in that place and in the other place. That was the Lord. Look back and remind yourself God did that. God did that. God gave me that. God protected me from that. God forgave me of that. Have you done that, beloved? This is the kind of God he is. This is the kind of God we have. Have we forgotten that it was the Lord who carried you like a mother, who disciplined you like a father, who taught you like a teacher, and who provided for you like a rich benefactor? It was the Lord, all the Lord, at every turn. And even if you look back and you're blinded by the the pain of this loss or those tears, have you stopped to consider what would have happened if God had not been there? Have you stopped to consider what would have happened if God had not carried you through it? If God had let Satan have his way with you or his, your enemies have his, their way with you? What would have happened if God had not been there for you? You see, we have no idea where we would be, how bad it would be now if God had not done all the good he has done in our life. All the good he's been doing all along. Because he has been good. The Bible says he is good and does good. Whatever it is, congregation, all your good is from him. All your mercy, all your grace, all your salvation is from him. All your hope for today and tomorrow and evermore is from him. And the passage demands of you, what is your response to him? Are you as ungrateful as Israel? Are you as bent on backsliding as Israel? Or will you, as Paul says, learn Learn from Israel and resolve by God's grace to be a thankful people, a worshiping people, a grateful people, an obedient people. You see, in this passage, this is our boast this morning. That God is God and not a man. That's our boast. May it be in some measure from a human perspective, may it be God's boast this morning. That by his grace, we are his people. And we are not like the nations around us. That we are the redeemed of the Lord, as the psalmist says, who sing his praises. And that we're not the chaff that will be cast away when he comes to judge the earth. He's God and not a man. We are his people and not the world. God has given as a God. Let us respond as his people should. Let's love him. Praise him. And strive by his grace to be more like him. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, help. This is our prayer. We are no better than what we read upon these pages. We are no better than the person sitting next to us. We are no better than anyone out there. We are all likewise sinners. And if we find ourselves in here, the redeemed of the Lord, it is by your grace. Today, O God, we pray that we would stand more in awe of your goodness and greatness to us and that it would have its due impression upon us that we might be evermore, beginning at this very moment, Lord, a grateful people. Forgive us, O God, for our ingratitude. Forgive us for how much like man we really are. And by your grace, work in us that we might become more like Christ, the God-man, in whose, in whose humanity the glories of what you are making us into in, Lord, will indeed appear and have appeared. So help us to follow in his footsteps, to strive to be conformed to the Lord Jesus Christ and how we praise you that this is exactly what you're doing. Bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.